we woke to find our shared campsite alive with a quiet buzz. There was a kind of peaceful excitement in the air as all the riders went about their morning routines. Chatting, taking photos, and making coffee in their own various ways. We were the last riders to leave as we decided to take a slightly different route to Canberra. So details were exchanged, Instagram accounts were followed, and we bid our new friends farewell and made arrangements to catch up with some of them in the coming days. Me too. So, Swift Campout was amazing. Cool people, cool bikes, cool gear, good beer, good food. It was almost worth the struggle to get there. <laughs> Looks like there's a bit more struggle happening this morning. But um, yeah, this road should be much easier than yesterday. Plan now is to just get back on the main road. All the other guys left a bit before us and took the more kind of gravelly way. So we're thinking if we go like the easier way and get on the road, maybe we can like meet up with them again later on. Um, after that, the lunch is uh, lunch. The plan is to get lunch. And um, Ty, fellow we met at the camp out, is really lovely. He's offered to put us up for a few days. Um, and he's given, sent me a GPX file so that um, we can route directly to his house, which is awesome. Yeah, once there, we're going to hang around Canberra for a few days. Apparently there's a social ride on Wednesday that we've been invited to, so we'd quite like to do that. It's called Thirsty Work. And as you would imagine, it's because you go on a big bike ride and you go for beer afterwards. So uh, anyway, enough of that, let's go. seems despite taking the easy way out there's uh, still a fair bit of hiker bike involved but whereas on the way in we did like 600 meters of hiker bike on very steep very uneven very rocky ground this is only 94 on a perfectly graded road wow look at that though It's been a lot climbier than I thought it would be so far this morning. I thought it was just going to be like an easy downhill run into Canberra, but um, yeah, it's been a bit bumpy. However, this last descent has been insane. It is so steep and so fast. Bonnie is not so happy about it, <laughs> but at this rate, I guess it'll be over with quick. Here she comes. Really? You. Oh God, another hill. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, we've just passed through Thawa, um, across the lovely bridge there, and we're about to uh, link up in a couple of K with Ty's uh, route that he planned for us. So at that point, I'll be able to tell what kind of a distance we're gonna have to go to get to his place. All right, we've made it onto the route that Ty plotted for us, um, bike lane number one. And uh, yeah, let's see how this goes. Hopefully this should be a really enjoyable ride into the city. Oh yeah, because we're going to Canberra, new city. Stretching. 
We had no difficulty following Ty Street through Canberra's amazing cycle network, and after a great night's sleep, we spent the morning doing a bit of admin, like backing up SD cards and stuff like that, before heading into town around lunchtime for a spot of sushi. And after we were sufficiently stuffed with rice and seaweed, we made our way over to the National Film and Sound Archive of Australia. Oh, look, it's on the wall. Oh. My name is Shingo Ishikawa. I'm a document data consultant at National Film and Sound Archive. I initially studied as a paper consultant, but since coming here, I get to work with all sorts of crazy ideas. The Film and Sound Archive didn't really have much on, but we did enjoy their collection of artefacts of Australian film. In particular, this shoe from Priscilla, Queen of the Desert, made from flip-flops, or thongs, as they call them over here. And of course, while we were in town, we had to check out Bent Spoke Brewery and their selection of bicycle-themed beers. And check out that flight! We made sure to grab some to go as we'd been invited for dinner with a bunch of guys from the camp out. We ended up staying in Canberra for a few days and made pretty good use of the time. I visited a specialty fastener place and grabbed some bolts to fix my saddle. Thanks to Kieran for the recommendation and pointing me in the right direction because that was a big deal. I also managed to fit in a spin around the Arboretum, which is Amazing, a really awesome thing to have right in the city. There are miles of great single track there which wind through all sorts of interesting areas, such as this amazing cork forest. We also happen to be staying near to the Telstra Tower, which offers panoramic views of the entire city and gave Bonnie the chance to send a postcard from the highest post box in the ACT. Finally, we learned that our host Ty actually makes his own bikepacking gear, and he managed to find the time to make me a frame bag. Finding a frame bag to fit the massive triangle on my bike is just impossible, so having one custom made has always been a goal of mine. So cheers Ty! Well, what a city. We just had an awesome time in Canberra. Went to breweries, cycled all over town on its awesome infrastructure. Um, oh, I fixed my brakes. Don't know if I mentioned that, my saddle's now perfectly functional. Yeah, had a great time. Like those guys, like it was so kind of them to invite us there and they have an amazing crew. Like Canberra has like a really sick cycling community and great places to ride as well. So it's up there with them as a contender for one of our favorite cities in Australia, you know? So today, we're heading towards Goulburn. Um, I think it's like an 80K day, something like that. And on the way, we've planned to stop at a bizarre sculpture in a town called Collector, called the Dreamer's Gate. I don't know much about it, other than some guy, I think, just owns some land there and he just decided to build this bizarre thing. So um, yeah, we'll check that out. Supposedly, there's also a cafe there that's um, co-owned by one of the guys who was in the movie Bikes of Wrath, which is uh, 
a movie where, the, where a bunch of Australians go on a bike tour um, through, I think it's something to do with the American Dust Bowl, but they basically like take the route that they took in the Grapes of Wrath with today's equivalent of the money they had at the time. So I think back then it was like $4 or something to date amounts to like a hundred. Anyway, yeah, so um, yeah, that might be like a cool bikey type place to go. Getting out of town, we had to follow the main highway, which was busy, but it's got like a really wide bike lane. It's actually quite decent as far as highway cycling goes. But our warm showers host very kindly pointed out that you can, if you follow that, then you can get to the old highway, which is what we're riding now. It's a lot steeper, but it's quiet and it's the most direct route and the surface is good. I had picked like sort of a back roads gravel track way, but he reckons that with the bad weather we've had lately, that'd probably be a bit rough and a bit miserable. So yeah, cool. Got that local knowledge. All right, it seems um, our jaunt down the, the old highway has already come to an end and we're going back onto the main highway again. But it was nice, nice little detour, got us off the, got us away from the traffic for a bit. In 2015, five friends from Australia, inspired by the themes of migration, humanity, and wealth distribution in John Steinbeck's Pulitzer Prize-winning novel, The Grapes of Wrath, set out to cycle the 2,600 kilometers from Oklahoma to California, following the same route as the novel's impoverished main family, the Jodes. With only $420 between them, the five friends relied on the kindness of strangers and road magic to complete their journey, documenting their adventure for the film, The Bikes of Wrath. Some cafes owned by one of the five, Ollie Chiswell, and photos of the adventure hang from the walls of the cafe. So some cafe, pretty awesome. Um, uh, he's got some photos up in there, some really nice photographs actually of the, the trip they did in the movie. It's really cool. Anyway, right as a sun shower starts, we're just on our way to see this um, creepy sculpture. <laughs> you excited, Bonnie? Yeah. The collector, no, not the collector, the dreamer's gate. All right, let's have a look around. Maybe this way, I guess? Oh, wow. The story of the Dreamer's Gate in Collector, New South Wales, is as intricate as its design. Begun in 1994 by artist Tony Fantastes, the gate's main feature is a sleeping man surrounded by a strange and bizarre landscape of Tim Burton-esque flourishes unfurling from his dreams. Fantastes intended the gate to be an homage to his late father and the area's history of bushranger battles. However, during its construction, his son lost his battle with cancer, so instead it became a memorial to him. The face of the gate's dreaming man was modeled on his son. A lengthy battle with the local council, which threatened to demolish the gate, exhausted fan tastes, and he ultimately left Collector, leaving the dreamer's gate unfinished. 
All right, so how about that? So we're just heading back to the highway now and it looks like we're going to be riding the highway all the way to Goulburn where we're going to stay for the night. So I mean at this point there's probably not going to be a whole deal of footage. I reckon I might just switch the camera off for the day because um, yeah I don't think anyone needs to see us just like riding down the highway. So yeah we'll see. Um, yeah so see you later I guess.